to hopefully co-produce something together. Um, and in terms of our speakers tonight, um, Anna, Clint and Martin, we could have got a better uh, set of presenters. Uh, it's been very dark days in recent times for adult social care in respect to the funding that's available in terms of the, the struggling uh, staff that we have, but also in terms of the number of people who perhaps aren't supported in the way that we would aspire to support them. Um, and social care futures have been one of the bright lights of hope uh, over these difficult times. And we're delighted to hear more about their thoughts as a movement uh, and where they want to, to go in the future. So the plan for the event is going to be this. So Anna, Clinton and Martin are going to do a presentation. And we're going to stream that, um, if that's okay. So that's going to be streamed on the internet and then be available to download afterwards. And then once they've presented, we'll stop streaming, so you're safe to say what you want to say. Um, and then we're going to have a debate or discussion between uh, all of us here, um, not just for the presenters, but all of us have got something to contribute to the discussion. So that's where we're going to run it, if that's okay. And we'll plan to finish about quarter to seven. Uh, I've been asked to say, can you please sign in? That would be great. As ever, please be mobile phones on silent, but do tweet. Okay, we like tweeting. So uh, you can either tweet hashtag social care futures, or at Salt Future. Okay, so either of those would be great. And so do tweet and add your comments. Let's keep the debate online as well. So without further ado, I'm going to pass on to Martin, who's going to get things underway. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, Robin. Just uh, to be clear, the hashtag is Social Care Future, not an S on the end. Okay. <laughs> get, get the important things sorted out first. So uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, a big welcome to our Social Care Future session. Uh, and thanks so much to, to Robin and colleagues here at the centre uh, for the kind invitation to come and speak this evening. Uh, a special shout out, uh, I don't think she's in the room now, but Daisy King, uh, who works with Robin, has been helping us organise our day. And we've been behaving a little bit like a, a 70s rock band uh, with our demands and riders. You know, we wanted only yellow M&Ms in our dressing room and she's, uh, she's been great. So, so thanks for you to turn out on a wet, uh, wet November day as well. So I'm Martin Ratledge and I'm, I'm one of the conveners of Social Care Future. At the front here with me are Clemson Farkerson, a man of this parish, um, and uh, Anna, Anna Severite from the East Midlands. I don't know if there's a rivalry. Um, we're also got with us uh, Neil Crowther, who is, I would describe him as, um, a northern man stuck in the south. You know, you can take Bolton out of the boy. Yeah. Uh, so, so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about why we believe a big movement uh, for change in what we currently call social care is needed, how we're trying to build that movement alongside many others, what we've done so far, um, and our plans for the next stage. And we also want to talk to you about what you think and invite you to join in. So, to get this going, um, I'll introduce you to uh, Clinton and Anna. Uh, Clinton, uh, Clinton first, for anybody who doesn't know you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Clinton. Okay, uh, my name's Clinton Farkerson, and I'm born and bred in, in Birmingham, and I'm a person with lived experience of health and social care, and I run a disabled user-led organisation that's based in Chelmsley Wood, and it's called Community Navigator Services. I'm also the chair of Fit Local at Personal, which uh, uh, is a partnership that promotes personalisation and community-based support. I, uh, today, I would like to dare you to consider our radical idea. It's called being human, that I hopefully will catch up. And this simple idea is about people, relationships and lives. And we can do this through personalisation and a quirky idea of co-production. It may appear quite simple, but can offer a privileged insight and understanding and draw on our own experiences to help others. And I would describe myself as an optimist by nature. This, is, uh, this isn't the same as being positive. Positive is finding the light in the now. An optimist is seeing the light in the always. Thanks very much, Linton. Uh, so, uh, Anna, tell us about yourself. I don't really know how to follow that. <laughs> um, my name's Anna, and um, 
I like cleanse and use both health and social care and I have had mixed experiences of both I would say over the years. Uh, you'll hear a bit more about mine later and I'm the co-chair of an organisation called Coalition for Collaborative Care and we are all about promoting and personalised care within health and we work very closely with TLAP as our sort of sister partnership in social care. Thanks very much, Anna. So uh, I'm going to come to you for a bit more detail now. So um, you've helped us at Social Care Future to develop our emerging vision for the future that we want. Can you offer us some, some thoughts about how you believe life should be and the obstacles that our current system seems to put in the way or fail to remove? Yeah, so I'm afraid I'm sort of being a bit of the bringer of the, uh, the doom and the gloom, but bear with us, it will get better. So um, my first question really is why? You know, why do we need social care? Why do we need a social care future? What's wrong with now? You know, are we all happy? And I think, you know, as a sector, we hear a lot about there's a crisis, there's a lack of funding, social care, it's all kind of negative. The media talks about NHS bedrocking a lot. That's when you often hear about social care. Um, people like me who um, need social care, you know, we often receive quite a limited service and we're not getting the life that we want to live. And people working in the sector, when I talk to them, often feel really stressed, overworked, burnt out, people are leaving at quite a high rate. So it seems to me like we do need to rethink what we mean by social care. And, and we need to define what we want that future to look like. So for me, this future has to be for everyone. It has to be for the whole of society, but also for the people working in the sector and the people like me who access services. But I think we need to break down that divide between the them and us and it needs to be a coming together. Um, it's good for the community, I think. tick boxing and for people like me it's to allow me not just to survive but to actually feel like I'm thriving and, and living the life I want. So for me I think we are all part of the solution and that's why we're here today to talk about the social care future and to start that conversation how do we find that, that solution. Um, it's not just all about money I just want to throw that in there I know that's important but actually what we're talking about is more than that. So what do I want out of my life? What is a good life? And that will be different for everyone. If all of you here, if I asked you right now, you'd all say different things um, to me. Some of you might you know, have a favourite routine and supporting them is important to you, or your pets, or your family, or your job. And, and, and a lot of those things I think we just take for granted. We just get on with it in our lives. But for me, I was talking to someone earlier today, and I was saying, actually, if social care could be what I want it to be, what would that look like for me? And actually, it would be not limiting my life. So at the moment, I have to make a lot of decisions of what I can do based on if I've got enough hours of support to do that. So it limits me an awful lot. There's a lot of things I say, I can't do that, or I think I can't do this because I haven't got enough support to do that. And actually, for me, it would be about allowing me to live the life that I would have lived if I wasn't disabled, to just be getting on with a normal life and not having to make those decisions all the time based on the lack of social care. So at the minute, I, well, up until very recently, I got five hours a week for social inclusion. So that was the only, that was five hours that I was basically allowed to go out, able to go out of the house to do anything other than um, testing something. And most of that went on hospital appointments um, because they're not included um, in my personal budget. So I felt as a person very broken down into a whole load of tasks. I was sort of, you know, I could be washed, I could be dressed, I could have my housework done, I could have my food prepped, but as a person I'm much more than that. You know, I have dreams, I have ambitions, I want to work, I want to contribute to society, and I just wasn't being able to do that. And I think in our lives, you all and we all make choices all the time without even realising hundreds of little choices every day, you know, am I going to have a tea or a coffee? What time am I going to get up? What route am I going to take to work? And as soon as you enter service land, some of those choices, a lot of those choices, are sort of taken away from you um, without you even, you know, wanting them to be, obviously. And I think self-directed support 
things like the CARE Act, choice and control, they're all wonderful phrases, but a lot of us are not experiencing that at the moment. People are finding their lives quite restricted. So I spoke to somebody recently at an event, and she was saying that um, the carers come to put her to bed at 8 p.m. every night. And she was about my age. Um, and that's just not a normal life for someone of our age. And last week, though, we were at an event, and um, this guy called Andrew, he's a learning disability, and he was telling us about this fantastic thing called Geek Buddies, which has allowed him to be friends with someone with similar interests to him. So he can now go out, he goes to football matches, to the team he supports, um, which is also in his mother's good team. Um, he, um, <laughs> he's gone to see Star Wars on the night that it opened at midnight because he's a massive Star Wars fan. He's been to Glastonbury, you know, he was just full of these life experiences that for most people, if I, if, even if you want to go to Glastonbury, you can just go. But actually, as soon as you need some support in this country, it seems like a lot of people, that then becomes quite a difficult thing for them to do. So for me, some of the obstacles, I think, that, and the reasons for some of these challenges uh, one of them, I think, is lack of co-production. Um, I think we need all the people to be working together to build a social care that works for everyone. So that's people with lived experience, that's carers, that's people in the workforce, that's voluntary community sector. People from really diverse backgrounds, they need to have a voice because we are the experts in our own lives and what, what works for people. Um, I think some of it's about power. So we need people to work with us and not sort of do to us. Um, and certainly when I get that letter that says I'm up for review, I feel terrified because I know that in that dynamic, the person making the decision on how many hours I get, if I were to cut it or increase it, has all the power. Um, it needs to not be sort of tick box. Um, we need true co-production and we need true personalisation. You know, direct payments can be a fantastic tool if they're given to people with genuine choice, genuine control. And we need to come back to that root, that, that real reality of giving people that choice over their lives. And it needs to be really individual, because each person is different. So for Andrew, he wants to go see Star Wars. For me, I might want to go and see, I don't know, ballet or something. You know, totally different. And we need, we need to see everyone as individuals when, yeah. And then finally, I think for me, a big thing is trust. Um, for me, as someone who accesses services, I feel there's a lack of trust. So I'm scrutinised at every turn. Every letter that I receive has involved a threat that says, if you do not send this form back within two weeks, we will stop your direct payment. And that's my interaction with my local authority, and that feels very much like I'm being accused or suspected or something. And, um, and actually, my life is quite rule-based. There's a lot of rules. I can't use my PA to pick up a prescription because that's a health need. I can only have, you know, I can't use my direct payment for this and that. And, um, that's not the way to live a life, and that doesn't mean I can just get on with my life. But also, I think there's a lack of trust for staff, and I think for our social care to really change. I think we need to allow people in the sector to try new things, to innovate together, to work with individuals, and to be creative. So I think for me, I would just like to see more trust, really, between us all in the system. That's my reflection. Thank, thanks, Anna. We can clap. <laughs> So, so thanks for that pretty vivid um, description of the rhetoric reality gap between what I think most of us would agree are pretty positive policies, like the CARE Act, uh, and, and the lived experience, people's lives uh, in reality, and that gap between them that we clearly need to close. Clinton, I'm going to invite you to add your reflections. Um, I just firstly want to uh, thank Anna for describing her uh, experience. Because there's a lot of people out there when I come into contact with people who use services, carers and family members. Some of the how they describe the, the system they use, uh, I constantly hear words like it's a battle, it's a fight, it's a war uh, with uh, engaging with the local authority. Okay, uh, I use an analogy uh, of a house plant to describe how the care system can make you feel. And if you will, I'll share uh, uh, the analogy uh, with you. Uh, I think about a house plant, it's, if you think about a house plant, it gets watered, it gets fed. You, uh, if, you, uh, if you're lucky, you might even, the house plant might even be talked to. 
you know, having a conversation, <laughs> then put on a, a window ledge to hopefully get some sun sunlighting to help it uh, nurture. That is how the care system can make you feel. That's how most people describe it. That's surviving. That's not thriving. So that's, uh, you know, that's how you can make you feel. So um, my reflection would be, it's what unites us and only a diverse movement can drive the change we want. And we are, and I, I use the role we, we are society. And part of the element of that is co-production is essential. And for me, there's four building blocks for co-production. One is about values, and values are, are the deepest, at the deepest level, are our personal uh, being of uh, values, and they are what is most important to us. And values are used to determine how we spend our time, how we evaluate the time we spend, and most importantly, we are always fully aware of our values. And clarity of value is an essential supporting tool to understand that. And if you think about it, it's, it can be an asset in times of darkness and ambiguity if you know your values. Because it can set the intention of the words, thoughts, and behaviors. And then aligning that will hold more importance to us if we understand that. So, my second building block, and I talked about power, sharing power, who gets to make the decisions? How do we relate to one another? Who has power over? Who has power with? Power is the most commonly understood as a form of authority, control, or domination. So those with authority over others are considered powerful, while those who are dominant are seen as, you know, powerless, I would see, be seen as powerless within the system. And this kind of power, we don't really talk about it, and we don't really understand it. The third one uh, of uh, the building block is about language. The language we use is very, very powerful, and changes over time, or doesn't. <laughs> Let's look at that example, words like service users. Is it fixed, or does it evolve? Language is that powerful because words carry so much weight. Think of something you've read or uh, that has moved you, or a speech you heard that had some inspiration, or think of an insult or neg negative remark you've heard. It all carries emotion with it. And then my fourth building block is diversity. And what I mean about diversity, the power of diverse thinking. And there's a quote called, um, great minds think on a lot. And diversity of minds we need to engage with. We tend to surround ourselves with people who we might identify with in appearance, beliefs, or perspectives. But there's a proverb called, you know, uh, birds of a feather flock together. But the truth is that birds of a feather that flock together significantly hinder the success of co-production. The problem with the bird of a feather flock together is that it creates collective blindness. So the key point for uh, uh, co-production is, one, an awareness of voices both central and marginalised, two, being involved in this. Martin? Cheers, thanks, Andy. Uh, so, so it's clear... <laughs> so it's clear from those introductory comments that we, we've got a, a, a big challenge to, to try and address. Um, our current social care system has been described as a frozen system. Um, we, we had an event last week at the um, annual um, conference of the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services and um, a veteran former director of social services, I hope he wouldn't mind me calling him that uh, if he's in the room, um, and an advisor to many other directors pointed out that the main forms of support that are offered by our system have barely changed in decades. 
You know, the, the things that we spend most of the money on in social care have not really changed in 30, 40 years uh, as, as models. There are multiple elements in play, powerful elements in play inhibiting big change. And it's, it's really important, we think, not to be simplistic about this and not to place responsibility on single groups or in single places. People working in the system mostly work really hard in really challenging circumstances, financial and otherwise. <coughs> They need help to be partners in making big change. We, we agree with much of the criticism from what's called the sector um, uh, about financial cuts. The massive cuts of the last 10 years have done terrible damage. And we echo the calls that come for funding reform, but we don't believe that this is enough. We need major change in what social care does and how it does it. It's got to go far beyond a reactive, life and limb, transactional, personal care model. This is being met with public fatalism, something for others, something seen as best avoided. We share frustrations with government in action, you know, waiting for the green paper or Godot or whoever it might be. We, we share that frustration, but we can't use that as a reason to delay action to start to build a better future now. We believe that something much, much more is possible. But if you look at the manifestos of the parties of this election, and even to a large extent the demands that have been made on those parties by the loudest voices in what tends to get called the sector, the thinking and ambition remains really narrow. Even when we see proposals for big extra spending, the focus stays on personal care for some people. We want to encourage and support the voices looking to shift out of this narrow focus towards a vision of something much more expansive, and that everybody can see as relevant and important to them. Otherwise, we'll stay stuck, frozen. We also don't think that the Treasury will be keen to release large amounts of money for a system that's perceived and described by its advocates as unsustainable and what future generations won't see as acceptable. The good news, though... Sorry, we're moving on to the good news now. I should point that out. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's mood can start to lift at this point. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. There are movements and alliances over several decades in this country and in other countries, often led by people and families, with supportive professional allies, and sometimes people in policy and political roles. These, mo these movements have achieved some big shifts, and they've improved policy, and they offer us some clues to strategies and tactics that we might use to take things further forward and to accelerate positive change in what makes up our system. As well as learning from the UK, there's also learning to use from successful social movements across the globe. So, we are looking as a movement, as a, I suppose you could call a fledgling movement. I'm sorry to carry on using the bird analogies. Can you, how do you say that? Birds of a feather, it's like a tongue twister. Birds of a feather flock together. I'm not even sure I, yeah, I did it. Yeah. So we are looking to turn our frustrations into positive, thoughtful action, an ambitious action, to both create the underlying conditions for big change and to start to model and to grow it. Clinton's going to say a little bit about how we've started that. So we decided we needed a movement and I'd like to introduce a video of last year's gathering of 300 of us coming together in Manchester in parallel with the National Children's and Adult Social Care Conference. We were offering challenge to model a positive, inclusive, and action solution focused gathering. But uh, we were also looking for partnerships with those leading and running social care. Here's a little glimpse. And some so, so, of you might recognise it. Yeah. Oh, my. 
started something um, and now we're trying to take it forward. Anna's going to say a little bit about what our approach is. Yeah, so the way we're sort of doing things is trying to bring together a really diverse group of people, um, old and young, people with lived experience, professional allies, to senior people, people that use services, anyone, anyone with a stake in social care. I think ultimately, actually, that is everyone in society, or it should be everyone. But obviously, to start with, we're, we're getting the people that are in, have an interest, and usually that is either because they or their family use access services, or um, they might work in services, or they've been involved in some way. Uh, we're not an organisation, it's a network and a growing movement of people, and um, different people are making lots of different kinds of contributions to that. And there's a way for everyone to be involved and to contribute. Everyone's contributions are valued. Um, in Control are hosting us and providing us with some admin support. But we are convened on narrative, the public narrative, and that's the piece of work um, that we're doing. And we're learning from other social movements and campaigns, and we're employing the science and methodology of framing to do that, which is really a conscious effort to attend to what our message is and the visual story we tell cause people to think and feel, and what that motivates them to do, to believe, or to seek in the world. Um, now, the godfather, if you like, of framing, George Lakoff, has said that frames are mental structures that shape the way we see the world. And in politics, our frames shape our social policies and the institutions we form to carry out policies. So changing framing, is, it's not just a communications thing. Changing frames is to change all of that. Framing is part of social change. Um, we're not alone. A number of other movements are embracing this me methodology. Perhaps the most well-known example in recent years has been the very successful campaign for equal marriage, which involved a conscious shift from talking about the civil rights of LGBT groups to emphasising messages of family and love and relationships and civil union. And that message of equal marriage, that idea of getting away from otherness to the idea of, of, of equality, has been hugely successful as a, as a motive for that change. But in the UK right now, a number of other organisations are using these methodologies and developing them. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation has a major project to reframe the way we think and talk about poverty. There is work going on in terms of how we message and talk about climate change, migration and immigration, human rights, a whole range of other fields. And one important thing for us is that we, we are in contact with those organisations and learn from them and sometimes in alliance uh, with them as well. Um, a guiding principle of this work is really to try and shift the message from fear to hope. Um, uh, there's a communication specialist in the, UK, in the US called Annette Schenk Rosario, and she's made the point really that Martin Luther King never ever gave a I have a complaint speech. 
Um, we didn't, didn't need to do that to sense the injustice he was talking about. In fact, by giving that vision of hope and the potential of the future, he was able to reinforce the injustices much more powerfully. But if we look at the narrative around social care presently, we're not doing that. The narrative is overwhelmingly dominated by one of failure and crisis and lacks a sort of sense of where we should be and what social care should be doing for people. So it's really about leading our messages, not with problems or messages of crisis and vivid case studies of what's going wrong, but with a compelling value-based vision of the world as we want it to be, how the solutions we advocate will take us there, and the changes that need to, to happen to make that a reality, the obstacles we need to remove that are presently in our way. Um, and working on that requires research, which we, uh, we've begun. Uh, we published the report on the screen uh, last month. Uh, what that looked at is what the current narrative is. So we, uh, we looked at how the sort of dominant organisations in the sector that are campaigning for change messaged uh, social care. We, uh, with the University of Lancaster, uh, Lancaster University rather, um, uh, are able to kind of look at how the media talks about social care. So they've got a piece of software and analysed stories on social care for the last two years and comes up with kind of key messages that are embedded in those stories. And we've also done some work to just talk to the general public about how they think and feel about social care as well. So we've begun that research. Um, but it's part of a kind of, I've got that other slide with the heart wipe. Um, it's part of a kind of four step process um, there. Um, well, we begin by trying to really crystallise what the changes we're trying to bring about. We've been doing that today, so we've been here all afternoon. We're all looking a bit bleary-eyed, that's why. Um, the landscape, which is the, the report that we just published, but we're doing further work on that. So Lancaster University at the minute are tracking how the political parties are talking about social care and how people are talking about social care and social media during the election, and we'll have a new report out um, in the new year on that. Then we need to take a deep look at mindsets. So how do the public, general public now talk and think about social care? So we'll be doing research into that. And then finally, the crucial thing, persuasion. What sort of stories can we tell that really carry forward our values, our way of thinking about the world, that are sufficiently persuasive with public audiences to make them invest in our, in our worldview and to move them in that direction? So it's a four-stage research process which we've uh, now begun. Um, <coughs> In Manchester earlier this year, we uh, began to do some work on this and work out what our vision was. Could we kind of crystallise in, in kind of everyday terms? So there's a lot of language about asset-based approaches and co-production and so on. It's words that are just meaningless to the larger public that are disconnected from this, important though they are. How could we actually turn our values and our way of thinking into a language that really did, uh, was more effective at connecting? Now this is, this is stuff that we've done without all the research yet. But we came up with this high-level vision, and we've begun to use it on social media and other contexts. And it seems to have had quite a bit of traction. And I'll explain what it's supposed to do in a second. But the vision really said, you know, we all want to live in the place we call home, and the people and the things that we love, in communities where we look out for one another, doing the things that matter to us. And that very high-level vision, I think, paints a very different sense of what social care is, what it should do for us, what it's about, than much of the messages that you will hear in the in the media at the minute and that have come out of organisations campaigning for change. But it deliberately doesn't talk about, doesn't other people, it talks about something, shared values, something we should all want, we all desire. It talks about things that speak to personalisation but in a way that everyone would get, doing things that matter to you. It speaks to the idea of reciprocity, uh, the idea of being in communities where we do things for one another rather than just people being the objects of care and support. Um, and crucially, I think, it talks about being able to choose where and with whom you live, being in the place you call home. We did an exercise in Manchester that wasn't kind of technical, it was kind of what does home mean to you? And when people talk about home, they don't talk about a place and infrastructure, they talk about how they live their lives and privacy and their relationships and the things they feel. So it has a very kind of visceral sense of you know, what home means. So that's what that's about. We need to do a lot more work on it. But that was our kind of starting point. And we did some further work there about the the, the ways we imagine this working, how that was different from how social care works uh, generally. So we talked about how great social care helps us all to achieve this vision by reviving our sense of hope and purpose, how it helps us all to keep or regain control over our lives, to connect and sometimes reconnect with the things that are most important to us and to realise our potential. And in terms of the ask, um, 
something we've been trying to do is get a balance between the question Martin talked about before in terms of resources and, and our broader vision of how things should work in saying that the government must commit more resources to our social care future. But to be sustainable, they have to also enact reforms to unlock the abundant resources and power to make change that already exist in individuals, in families and communities. That we need to make this social care future together. So we move away from this idea that it's simply a question of something the government alone can resolve, uh, or that it's just a transactional service, towards this idea that we've heard about this morning, that it's about an ecosystem, it's about a whole range of things that come together to make the change that we, that we want. But in terms of the public narrative, just quickly, um, this is a summary, but ultimately what we're hearing over and over again is that social care, which fails to look after vulnerable people adequately, leaving them to be neglected and abused, is broken and in or on the brink of a crisis. The cost of social care is spiralling because there are growing numbers of older and disabled people and funding hasn't kept pace with demand. Councils, the NHS and providers are under severe strain. The system can't cope. Other valuable services are threatened. Only government can solve this, but governments for the past 20 years have failed to. The government's green paper, which keeps being delayed, probably won't change anything. We need an extra three and a half billion pounds immediately to plug the gap and shore up social care, but it's nowhere near enough to truly fix things. And if you need care today, you'll lose your home to pay for it, and it'll still be terrible. That is the message that is being given to the public time and time again. And we assume that that will motivate them to think social care is something that should be invested in and grown. And that's what we want to challenge and, and turn around. Um, to, yeah. Thank you. Cheers, Neil. Thanks. Blimey, that sounded like a uh, really positive vision for us to organise uh, <laughs> around. So, so yeah, we're, we're, we're uh, sorry to use the word, Neil, but we're co-producing and co-developing uh, with lots of people, a sense of what this could look like, what this could be, what we could stretch towards, what we should stretch towards, what we can invest in. Uh, and then we're, we're doing work around how do we talk about that to people in a way that it means something to them and it can motivate them and drive them to want to be part of changing that. So when politicians knock on the door at election time, they say, we really should do something about this and we can do something about it, yeah? which is not what happens at the moment. In addition, we've got two other elements. One we're calling glimpses of the future, coalitions of the willing. So, as someone said, that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And as we co-develop our vision of the future, we want to build a detailed jigsaw uh, picture of uh, the pieces that we need for that future. And we're using our networks, which are pretty wide and deep, to discover around the country the glimpses of a better future that are already existing, already happening, and exploring how they happened and how they might be grown and spread and connected. And in parallel to that, we're looking for people and groups and places and partnerships who want to make these things change and happen in their places and find out what help they need and who can offer it. Uh, as an example of this, uh, over the past few months, I've been talking to lots of directors of social services, one-to-one, -one, you know, informal conversations, trying to find out from them as, as people who have got you know, terrific local responsibilities for trying to keep social care going and improve it. What, what are the things that re they really want to see change? Um, you can imagine it's quite a long list that they gave me. One, one of the really interesting things that, that emerged from quite a few of them though is that this thing that we currently call home care, um, which you know, is often purchased in 15 minute um, slots, sometimes one minute slots. Um, where we pay people very low wages uh, and we give them zero hours contracts or split shifts, not salaries. And where they're going to people's houses uh, and it's a different person every day. And where um, uh, you know, the people that are, that are working uh, like this often leave. You know, there's a 30-40% turnover of people in a, in a year. The, the, the directors I've talked to are really motivated to do something about that. We get into a point, I think, where um, people are saying, we can't just wait for the government to sort that out. We've got to do something about it. Uh, and so what they want to talk about is, what can we do about it? Is there other people out there that are offering better ways of doing it? How do you do that? How can you connect us to those people? What would we need to change about how we commission things around here to make that possible? Can we make changes with the resources we've got at the minute? 
if, we, if some more money comes in, how could we build on that? People are asking these questions. And so we've got to connect these visions of how things could be and these glimpses of people doing it at the minute with people who are minded and, and wanting to show what can be done. Exemplars uh, to, to, to build on and to share with others and to connect to their peers. So that's what we're doing. Um, we, um, we're partnering with lots of people to do this. Uh, and uh, th this is a, a graphic that some people might have seen uh, that's from Social Care Institute for Excellence, Think Local Act Personal, and Nesta. Uh, and in gathering these glimpses of the future, they've been doing this on, on a reasonably systematic basis. They've been finding out what are the new and different and better ways uh, that this thing called social care could be done, which are currently on the margins in order to consider how we bring them into the mainstream. Recently, something called the Social Care Innovation Network got going. Uh, this has been funded by the Department of Health and it's being organised by Sky and TLA and Shared Lives Plus. And they're bringing together councils with the people that have got these better ways of doing things and local citizens to work out what's stopping these things from moving from the margin to the mainstream. What can we do about that? Who can do what? Who do we need to work with to make those changes happen? We will, of course, need to further develop uh, and we'll need to use all sorts of conduits of influence and support to build from these initiatives and these exemplars. Today we've been more, doing more thinking about our strategy for doing that, our, to, to use a jargon, theory of change, which Neil will say a little bit more about in a moment. The third element uh, of our approach is challenge. So we know there's a rhetoric reality gap between policy like the CARE Act and, and well-being and self-direction elements of that, which uh, Anna and Clinton have made clear to us today. So people's common experience doesn't reflect what that policy says in the main. And there's no doubt that resources are a really big factor in this, but they're not the only factor. There are good examples around the country, for example, of people being able to use their personal budgets in really creative and flexible ways. Everybody should be able to expect the best, shouldn't they? So what we want to do is to challenge at all levels, from policy to local to individual, but we want to do that in ways which offer solutions and draws people who are interest in, interested in making those solutions happen on a bigger scale for many, many more people together and support them to support each other to do that. Alongside that though, we are looking to uh, align with those who are really looking at a local level to get knowledge and ideas and sometimes, you know, mediation, sometimes dare I even say Julie Stansfield's in the run, front here, lawyers involved, you know, because sometimes that is, is necessary. Sometimes it's necessary to challenge to that level. That isn't the ideal situation, far from it, but you have to have that available. We want to uh, create a network, and In Control is starting to do this, of user-led organisations, family organisations, local branches of charities, to have the best information possible about how things could be and what the law says things should be, and what tactics and strategies they can use to shift in that direction. So uh, just a shameless plug here for an in-control publication uh, which helps with that, which is on their website. So, how can we make big change happen? Today, many of us have been working on our strategy. Neil's gonna tell us a little bit more about where we got to today. Thanks again. Yeah, uh, so we finished at four o'clock after uh, six hours, so the idea I'm going to be able to summarise all of that is that uh, it's not going to happen. Um, so these are just some headlines. Just to tell you what you've been doing. So it brings back to the build on. And, and one really key exercise uh, what are the main arguments that are made against our ideas? Who's making them and why? And our ability to understand that and be able to respond to those, those arguments effectively. Um, so, uh, just a kind of headline summary in terms of the, the change people were seeking, the kind of vision of social care working in the way that we would like it to. Um, somebody came up with a really nice metaphor of it being like invisible scaffolding. 
that you know it should just be there. It should just be allowing us to lead the lives that we, we want to lead. It should be dominating us. It should be colonising our lives. It's part of the scaffolding that allows us to to live the lives we, we wish to. That it should be this picks up from points Anna and Clenson have Clenson have made. It's something that's done with and by people. It's not done to people. That's fundamental, I think, to our, our view of the world. It's something that connects us to each other. It's a binding agent. It invests in our relationships. It's not there to disrupt them or take them over or replace them. It's about building them. It's about undergirding them and strengthening them. The key thing that's rarely, I think, talked about or, or part of the messaging of social care is the idea of social care transporting us. Um, it's, it's Anna's point. People shouldn't be limited by their social care support. Social care support, or whatever we call it, should be taking people from one life situation to a better one ultimately, but the narrative tends to position social care as an end in itself, but it doesn't do anything. And very often it's kind of trapped in a debate about ageist, about older people, about managing decline and so on, rather than the idea of human development and growth. So that was key. That it should bring joy. Um, I love seeing those slides from Manchester because there's just lots of laughter on them. Um, so much of the imagery of social care, there is no no joy in it whatsoever. It's all kind of, there's this pipeline of misery. But people want, want joy, they want happiness, and that's got to be there. It's about love, we shouldn't be afraid of that. It's about love and relationships. Um, it's about nurturing people's gifts and talents and allowing people to grow and be the best of themselves. It's about belonging, uh, people's right to be in the world, be part of the world. The idea of people knowing best and that any support should be on tap rather than on top, absolutely crucial. Um, it's not about personal care, it's about a life and having a life and focus on the results and the lives that people are living. Um, one interesting thing that came up was that there's a lot of debate at the minute about professionalising the care workforce. And actually there was a counter to that here, that it wasn't about seeking somebody with care skills, that it could be much more about matching people with shared interests uh, to work together. And a very different kind of way of thinking about how personal assistance works to how care works in terms of the paradigm is there. Other ideas and buzzwords, you know, it's about focusing on strengths rather than deficits, but you know, that's not as kind of glib as it sounds. Um, one of the really challenging things that people identified was how we might sit and talk about strength-based approaches and focusing on what people can do, but anyone who's accounts of the social care system knows the only way they can access and be deemed eligible is to advertise all the things they can't do and all their deficits and all their problems. And until we're able to change that, we're always going to have this tension and this difficulty. Um, it's about shifting the debate from the cost of social care to its value, to actually what it does for society and for individuals, how it changes lives, and about taking both the battle out of social care and the fear that I think a lot of people feel. Uh, people should approach social care thinking it's going to improve their lives, aid their lives, allow them to have the life they want. I sense as many people approach it with trepidation, thinking we're going to have to give a lot of things away. And that, that's going to be absolutely key, the psychology of that. Now, this is where I can't really do justice today, but just some of the priority areas that people identified as needing change to reach some of those points. One was we needed to focus first less on social care as a system and more on people, place and communities as our starting point. It's kind of panavision, really. And that social care is this one part of the public and social infrastructure that shapes our opportunities to lead the lives that we want to lead. We need to have this conversation in policy terms, so we need to kind of move out of this kind of silo, but in, in, in messaging terms as well. The vision I shared with you before is not something that's bound by social care, it's about how we're all able to live our, our day to day lives, but we have to also then think beyond. So people said, you know, well, if you take the stuff at the minute around social prescribing, for example, and the debate there, that's, that's great on lots of levels. But, uh, and the debate about social care, though, is all about the lack of funding. But we also know something that's happened over the last decade is disinvestment in community and social infrastructure. Mm. So unless we're focusing on that wider social infrastructure that changes our lives, we won't realise our vision. So we have to think in broader terms about housing, about local economic policy, about arts and culture, the whole kind of gamut, really, to sort of take that forward. So it certainly has to be within our field of vision. Um, General public perceptions. Um, people, unprompted really, did believe that public attitudes are an obstacle to change. Um, and that was uniform across the groups. Now we have to work out, you know, the public's a big thing, we have to work out which public audiences, which segments of the public that we particularly need to reach. But there was a sense that public thinking about social care is an obstacle to moving social care to where we need to get to. So we kind of justified the sense of doing this, this work. Um, 
people, and also at the level of politics, but also at the level of individuals, um, you know, people don't approach their GP or the NHS with the same kind of trepidation, sense of fear that they might approach social services, for example. So there's a deep psychological thing that we have to try and attend to in this narrative work. There was a real sense that we needed to learn from other fields, and people were particularly struck by the way young people were engaging in so much with climate action. Are there opportunities to engage with young people to actually move this debate out of this box where it just seems to be about older people at the end of their lives, where it becomes a much more kind of area of universal concern, and we harness those movements for change. Um, there needed to be much more representation of lived experience amongst decision makers at local and national uh, government level. Government needs to be prepared to listen more and to collaborate more. Now we're making some inroads there, but it's felt to me like we've slipped backwards from that, from some of the progress we were making in the late 2000s. We need to put that right back on the agenda. Um, and as Je Jenny, who's not here now, was saying earlier, this whole process of moving away from the idea that there is a sector and professionals here and there are people requiring support over there for something that is much more collaborative, much more about everyone in it together and how we, we achieve that. We really need a more of an appetite for trial and error, for risk and for innovation, learning from things not working rather than regarding them as just failure. That seems to be something that's too absent from this and some of the ideas we have don't get off the ground because there's a nervousness about investing in them, about seeing whether or not they work. So we, we've talked potentially about trying to see if we could persuade government or some other body to carve out money for innovation, to actually create that space for that to happen rather than expect it just to happen within very risk averse, often very risk averse local council structures and, and politics. And lastly, and it's, it's back to the point that Mark's already made, we have to build on good policies. We have to emphasise the ideas and approaches that exemplify what it is we want to see move from the margins to the mainstream. And we need to learn how we can spread and grow them um, sustainably. That's got to be an absolute key thing. There was lots more. I've got piles of uh, flip chart paper to put through. But those were just some of the headlines that came out of it. I hope that was fair to those that were there as a, as a quick summary. Thanks, Neil. So, we, uh, so, Clinton, I think you're going to invite people to help us now, aren't you? Yeah. You've, you've listened to uh, us talk. <laughs> and we would like you to consider this question. We'd like to ask you your help to help us. Um, and the, the question is, for a few minutes, we want you to have a chat with the people around you. To, uh, and if you could, if you could jump into uh, Doctor Who's TARDIS and go forward ten years towards a future you would like to see. What would have changed? So if you could just uh, gather, have a conversation. You've heard what we've been talking about. You have a chance. You're in Doctor Who's TARDIS. And you've gone 10 years into the future. What's changed? <laughs> Yeah. Like, like, help. And whenever.